Hello, and welcome to The Course. I'm Stephen, your host for today, and in this episode, I'll be speaking with Professor John Rappaport of the School of Law. Professor Rappaport received a degree in mathematics from Stanford before graduating magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. He went on to clerk for multiple federal judges, including Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and he practiced as a public defender and a litigator before joining the U Chicago Law School as a Bigelow Fellow and lecturer in law. He's now a member of the faculty of the School of Law, where he teaches and writes about criminal law, the criminal justice system, and the police. He's here to talk to us today about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. All right, Professor Rappaport, welcome to the course. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, um, before we get into your biography, can you just tell us, um, you know, uh, what what your position is and and what you do uh, in your current role at U Chicago? Sure. So I'm a professor of law uh, at the law school, and I teach courses on criminal law, uh, criminal procedure, and evidence. Um, and I do a lot of research about the criminal justice system, uh, mostly about policing and and other types of law enforcement. Okay. Um... Well, I, I look forward to hearing more about uh, that topic. It's obviously on a lot of people's minds these days. Um, but uh, we want to go back a little bit uh, into your your own life and your own journey. So um, I, <laughs> we'll start off with this, and uh, I know we're going way back. But um, when when you were a kid, you know, maybe like, I don't know, middle school or like early high school age, uh, what did you think you were going to be? and uh, Or what did you want to be? And I don't know, did it, did it bear any resemblance to, to what you're doing? Well, I can go back even farther than that, actually. I, when I was young, my parents bought me this Dr. Se- I don't know if it's a Dr. Seuss book. It, it looks like a Dr. Seuss book. It's, it, it has the same sort of uh, illustrations on the cover. It was called My Book About Me. And you fill out the book. You know, my house has how many doorknobs? And, you know, I have three mirrors in, in the second floor and things like this. And then there's a page where it says, uh, when I grow up, this is what I want to be. And um, I filled this out when I was about eight years old. And I said that I wanted to be either um, the president of the United States uh, or a policeman. (laughs) Um, So that's apparently, you know, that's the first marker uh, I can lay down. Uh, You know, as I got older and I got into middle school, high school, I think I was really thinking about it, honestly. I I think I was just focused on my friends and, and my my classes and my activities. And I, I always sort of gravitated toward math and science, um, I guess, to the extent that I ever contemplated it. Uh, I thought I'm going to do something with math and science, maybe be an engineer, build things, design things. Um, but, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to um, have a pretty you know, comfortable upbringing and I didn't have to spend a lot of time, um, I think, before I was ready, you know, getting too serious about, about my plans. Gotcha. Um, so can you just uh, a chart then sort of what your course was um, from undergrad and, and like through through the present day? <laughs> like if you could just sort of give us an overview of, of uh, that path. Yeah. So I do think that when I got into high school and, and, and later in the high school years and it became time to think about uh, where I wanted to go to college, what I wanted to study. And, and that, of course, raises the question of what you're going to do with your life. I do think there I started to feel a little bit of influence um, from my parents to maybe maybe think about choosing something that, you know, can make you some money and you can support family and that will kind of, you know, do something practical. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it it wasn't exactly like I was told I could be a a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, but it was it was something in that ballpark. (laughs) And I knew I couldn't be a doctor because uh, I'm too squeamish around blood and needles. And I, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I was pretty sure about that. My dad was a lawyer and, you know, from watching him, he seemed kind of stressed out and busy and I didn't really understand what he did. And so that, that wasn't that interesting to me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I said, I was, I was good at math and science. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll choose um, the one that doesn't involve blood and needles, um, but still involves math and science. And so I, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. So I applied to colleges uh, that had good programs in engineering. I thought that's what I was going to do. And, you know, I was extremely fortunate uh, to get into Stanford University, and that's where I ended up going. And I I showed up as as an intended um, engineering major at Stanford. Okay, so um, obviously something changed. Uh, (laughs) What what, what was it? And and was it during your undergrad uh, study or after that? Yeah, that's right. So... So first of all, I, I sort of pivoted from engineering to pure math. And 
this was basically just, you know, based on my experiences in classes. I took some engineering, I took physics, I took math, and I just really, really loved the math classes. But also I was good at them. You know, I did, I did fine. I did well in, in my classes in general. And I moved into a more advanced math series. And before I knew it, you know, I wanted to be a math major uh, and I didn't want to do engineering. And uh, believe it or not, you know, this was a little bit of, uh, this was something I was nervous to tell my parents, you know, because, <laughs> you know, pure math, it's also abstract, you know, that you got to do something applied where you can go out and get a job and make money. But, um, you know, this was, this was Stanford University in the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, the startup boom was uh, well underway and, um, there was a lot of appetite to hire people in STEM fields. So, uh, they blessed my decision to, to be a math major. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I did, but, you know, I also just grew a lot as a person. I made, uh, a group of friends, um, that was much more diverse, I think, than, um, the people with whom I grew up and people from, um, very different walks of life. And this is the period of my life when I started, um, becoming more aware of and more interested in, um, social problems of the day. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I was radicalized or anything like that, but I, I just sort of my political awakening. And I began to think that although obviously people in math and, and tech fields do lots of good for the world, um, I, I wanted to do something else. Um, and I wanted to, um, go into a field where I could work more directly, um, with people who were suffering. I wasn't sure you know, which population I, I had in mind. Um, but I knew that there was a lot of inequality in the world. A lot of it seemed to be based on, you know, morally irrelevant characteristics such as uh, people's race or, or ethnic background. And um, this was the period of my life when I, I sort of woke up and realized how unfair this all seemed and started to feel like I, I wanted to do something about it. Yeah, cool. Well, well put. Um, so like right after college, did you, what, what did you do and, and what were you looking to do? So, you know, even a couple of years into college, I was, I was still really pursuing the math and tech thing. I, I did a summer internship actually at Microsoft and it was around my junior, senior year. I was actually really on the fence um, about whether um, to keep going down that path or whether to pivot. And I was simultaneously researching graduate programs in things like math or applied math or maybe theoretical computer science, um, but also starting to research the idea of law school because that seemed to me like the best alternative if I wanted to really make a pivot and completely change directions and, and pursue a line of work that would allow me to try to intervene directly uh, in social issues. And maybe this is because uh, my father was a lawyer. Uh, he wasn't um, that kind of lawyer, he was a tax lawyer, but, you know, being a lawyer was something that was familiar to me. And so I, I really researched both and it was really a sort of game time decision. I ultimately decided to apply to law school, um, and, and not to apply to graduate programs in computer science or math. And so I, I applied to law school and I got in and I went to law school now intending to basically you know, leave those four years of education behind for the most part and um, become, I guess I would have said a civil rights lawyer um, when I first started law school. If you asked me, why are you here? What do you want to do? I would have said, I want to be a civil rights lawyer. And, you know, that's that's how I got from from there to to law school. OK, so um, how did this, uh, you know, this become your area of focus? Was that something that you sort of landed on during school or, or was that the result of later experiences? It was a little of both, but, you know, a lot of it was school. Again, um, I think when I got to law school, you know, your first year of law school, uh, you're basically told what classes you're going to take. There's a standard menu and um, the choices are made for you off that menu. And criminal law just really jumped out at me. And, you know, I don't know whether this is just, um, you know, an act of historical reconstruction, but the way I think about it today is that criminal law was especially appealing to me because it was so accessible and I had found it frustrating over the preceding four years that there were so few people in the world that I could talk to about the stuff I was studying. Um, you know, when I would go home for a vacation and my parents would say, well, what classes are you taking? And I would say, you know, real analysis. And, and I couldn't even explain to them um, <laughs> what it was really about. And, and, and that was frustrating. I couldn't explain to my friends. I, I felt like I was 
you know, off in this, in this little world, that was a stimulating, interesting little world. Um, but only the other people in that little world could talk to me about what I was spending my time working on. And when I got to law school and I took criminal law and I mean, you know, it seems kind of basic, but I thought, oh my God, we're just, we're talking about murder and theft. And these are important topics. And these are topics that everyone can understand and everyone knows about. And this is, this is really appealing to me. These seem like really sort of pressing immediate issues, both um, the commission of crime and uh, the consequences of and the punishment for crime, um, especially uh, when you view the latter through more of a systemic lens and you start to think about the fact that we have 2 million people in prison and, and other issues like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I really loved how, uh, you know, when I got in a taxi or I, I went to get a haircut and I'm making small talk and I'm saying, oh, yeah, I'm studying criminal law right now. And, and people just wanted to talk about it. People would say, oh, what do you think about the death penalty? Or what do you think about this case or that case? Or do you think OJ did it? Or whatever it was. <laughs> and I, I really liked that. Suddenly I felt like, Oh, I'm, I'm back in society again. And now I'm starting to develop this expertise in this thing that uh, everyone seems to want to talk about and everyone seems interested in. Okay. So um, did you always think that that meant going into academia? Like, did you always see yourself teaching and studying law in that way? Or, or how did that come about? I, I didn't. Um, obviously, I knew that there was such a thing as being a law professor because I knew there were people teaching my classes. But when I showed up at, at law school, it didn't even occur to me um, that that was something that might be in my future. I thought when I made the choice to, to not go into a PhD program in, in you know, computer science, I thought I'm going to law school to become a lawyer. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until sort of partway through my first year, I think it was the professors themselves. They seemed like such interesting people and they had such a great job. You know, I thought, wow, well, my dad was a lawyer and he's always at the office. He's always working. You know, he has this client that he has to service um, because that's basically what you are when you're a lawyer is you're a very well compensated servant to your client. <laughs> um, and these professors, boy, you know, they seem to have uh, a lot of intellectual freedom. They get to think and, and write about what they want to write about. It seems like um, people care what they say. Uh, they're, you know, quoted in the news and um, they're interviewed when there's some legal controversy going on. And then they get to teach students and that seems kind of fun. And, and so I just started to look at them and think, this is the job I want. I want to be like them. Um, you know, and I would go do an internship, you know, in your law school summers, you, you do internships out in the field. And I, I enjoyed those and I enjoyed the people I worked with, but still when I would come back to campus the next year, I would think that summer thing was great, but man, it would be so great to, to work at a university and, and to stay here. And your whole job is just to learn stuff and then tell people about what you've learned. And it started to just become really, really uh, appealing to me. And so it was, you know, during my years at law school um, that I, you know, increasingly uh, developed this inclination towards academia, but I also knew that it was very, very competitive. Um, to get into academia. Most of my professors had uh, achieved things that at the time felt very out of reach, you know, like, oh yeah, it's great for them because, you know, they were first in their class at, you know, Harvard or Yale and um, they clerked at the Supreme Court and they did all these amazing things. And, you know, I uh, wasn't the very most successful student my first semester of law school and got a little better in my second semester. And then it picked up from there. But you know, at the beginning, it, it wasn't at all clear to me that this was something that was going to be attainable for me. Um, so I it was sort of torn. You know, I thought this is really appealing, but, you know, I shouldn't get my hopes up um, and I should probably be prepared to to go out and, and practice law because this whole academia thing might just not happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, how, how did you sort of uh, end up in, in this particular field of study, looking at criminal justice and policing? Was there anyone who sort of guided you toward that? Or was there like an event that um, that sort of put you on that track? How, how did you end up doing the kind of research you do now? You know, when I was a student, um, we had to write these substantial papers um, for graduation. And you had to find um, a faculty member to advise uh, your efforts. And um, I sought out a guy named Bill Stunts, William Stunts, who, you know, I sort of now know with the benefit of some uh, temporal perspective, 
you know, was really a, a generational um, figure in, in my field. He was really the best uh, criminal procedure scholar of, of a large cohort. And he also was just an unbelievably nice guy and really generous with his time. And he agreed to, to supervise my writing. And his was also the first legal scholarship that I ever read. Uh, you know, at the beginning, I just took classes and I just read the cases and I didn't do any sort of extracurricular reading. And when I got to know Bill a little bit, I just thought everything he said was so interesting. And I wanted to, you know, go out and read some of his scholarship. And, and when I read it, it just, it just really opened my mind because I, I do think that the way that law professors think and write about the law is a little bit different from the way it's taught in the classroom. And it's, it's broader and it's more creative and it's more system level. And it was all just so uh, intoxicating to me. And I, I worked really hard on that paper. And I, I can remember the day, I can picture it actually, um, sitting in Bill Stunts' office. And, you know, he, he sort of looked at me and he said, this is good. You know, this is really good. If, if you want to do this, you can do this. Um, and I would be happy to to be a supporter. And that was huge um, because, yeah. you know, here I was thinking, you know, the path forward was to, you know, graduate number one in the class, which looked like it was out of reach. And, you know, here's this guy who was basically at the top of his field um, telling me, I, you know, I'm tapping you. I'm, I'm saying to you, I think you can do this. Um, and it just made a tremendous difference to me. It gave me an enormous confidence boost um, that I, I subsequently called upon in many stages. Um, Bill Stunts tragically passed away very early. I think he was about 50 years old, give or take. Um, before I ever became an academic, um, he had passed away. And so, you know, he never got to, to see me make it. But um, I saw him a couple more times after graduating law school. And he was, again, just um, incredibly supportive, asking me, you know, are you doing it? Are you going for it? And you, you should go for it. You can do this. And it, it just made all the difference. Yeah. I, what a, what a huge, um, that must be so like helpful, um, and really encouraging to, to hear someone say that, you know, like, you know, I want to support you in this. Okay. So let, let, let's turn a little bit now to, um, you know, your, your current work. You mentioned this sort of just intoxicating thing of, um, you know, reading, uh, the stuff that you were reading in law school. And, and you also mentioned, uh, a little bit, I think, uh, about your students and how exciting it is to work with them. So, I mean, what what is fulfilling to you about what you do now? Like, what, what do you really enjoy about it? I think with the field of law, um, and this is a gross oversimplification, but sometimes you can think about, you know, working from inside the system or, or working from outside the system. And when we train lawyers, um, we're mostly training them to work from inside the system. We're teaching them, you know, the rules of the game so that they can go out there and play it on behalf of their clients. Now, of course, there is also education about, you know, why the rules are what they are and do they need to be what they are? Should we change them? And so on. So it's not that we don't think about any of that stuff when we're, when we're in the classroom, but, um, you know, for the most part, we're preparing them to go out into a profession. Um, when you're a law professor, you get to, to be outside the system and you have a lot more degrees of freedom. You can think and write about theories and ideas and proposals that, um, you know, maybe aren't totally realistic today, but you're, you're planting the seeds. You're trying to change the way that people uh, think about these systems. And, um, you do have to be a believer in the power of ideas. I mean, there are definitely days when I think, you know, I sold myself on the idea that this was sort of a, a public service type of job. Um, but is that really true? Or is it really just self-indulgent? And I just sit here and I write my little articles and, you know, nothing ever changes. Um, and then other days where I think, wow, you know, when I get this information out into the world, people are going to read it and hopefully they're going to believe it because I've, I've done my best to, to do rigorous work and um, maintain a, a, a good reputation for integrity and honesty and and, you know, if it, if it does uh, reach people and they do believe it, you know, it really might change something in the world. Um, and that's really exciting, too. That's interesting. So how do you view your role as a professor uh, in a position where, you know, uh, you, you have to teach these people and prepare them for a career in this profession? 
but you also have these opportunities to take a critical lens to it. And um, as you say, you know, really bring about a change in the world. I mean, I, I think law students can go in so many different directions um, in the profession. Obviously, they could become academics. Uh, like me, they could go out and, and be corporate lawyers. They could become public defenders or civil rights lawyers. And they're going to take uh, a particular understanding of, of the law and the legal system with them and a particular set of attitudes about how to treat each other and, and to treat their opponents and to treat their clients. And I guess I think of it as a, a mixture of trying to, to encourage them to be good people and to make the world just a little bit less combative and, and hellish, <laughs> but also to you know sh shape their ideas. And I don't think I have um, some particular agenda. When I say shape their ideas, I don't actually mean get them to believe what I believe. If anything, I see as one of my big roles in law school as teaching them really to see all sides of an issue. And I think that one thing that really good lawyers are really good at, it's being able to identify and even sympathize with uh, the strongest arguments on the other side of an issue. And so when students come in uh, with very strident, uh, but sometimes ill-considered views, even when those views actually resonate with my own, um, I, I try to push them. I try to encourage them. I try to get them to take the other side seriously. It's really, you know, a long-winded way of saying I try to um, cultivate good lawyers, and I hope that a lot of those lawyers are going to go out and, and do things um, that they and, and that I would consider good in the world. Some of them, you know, may even follow in my footsteps and become professors like me, and, and then they can, you know, in turn uh, influence their own uh, generations of students. Well, speaking of those uh, future generations, what advice would you have for someone who was considering following in your footsteps and uh, going into law, but uh, staying in academia and, and doing the kind of research that you do? Well, I think law is a little bit different from a lot of other uh, academic fields. For law professors, um, there's a lot of different ways. I, I think the two main ways would be to either um, really distinguish yourself as a lawyer. So you go to a good law school, you do well at school, you get judicial clerkships with um, prestigious federal judges, maybe you accomplish a little something out in practice. And then when a law school is looking to hire faculty, they think, hey, this is a, you know, this is not just a smart person, but someone who really knows what it means to be a lawyer. Um, the other path, though, which is increasingly common uh, in the last decade or two, is actually for people who are earning law degrees to also go on and get a PhD in what we would call an allied field. Um, the most common ones might be things like history, political science, maybe public policy, economics, uh, sociology, criminology, fields like that. And then you become something of a hybrid scholar where you have uh, a disciplinary expertise in a field other than law, but you are also trained as a lawyer and you bring that expertise to bear on legal problems. But the, the biggest overarching piece of advice would be uh, to get advice early um, from, you know, people who have been successful at doing what you want to do. I, I remember during my first year, I went to one of my professors and I said, um, well, I, I think I want to be a law professor. What should I be doing? You know, and I really thought he was going to say things like, well, read these 10 books or you know, write an article about such and such. And he looked at me and he said, get good grades. And, you know, at the time, I thought this was a pretty frustrating piece of advice because, of course, I was already trying to get good grades. But actually, there was a lot of wisdom to it because he knew enough to know, look, there's nothing in particular that you're going to do during your first year of law school that's really going to, to change your trajectory or influence the possibility that you'll become a law professor that's more important than just doing well in law school. So for right now, actually, my advice is don't worry about it. Just worry about being a law student. And then maybe, you know, next year or your third year, we can talk again. And, and so I would encourage people who are considering trying to go into academia uh, in law to, to find people to talk to early and to get advice and to learn about the different pathways and to, to think about uh, what makes sense to them because there's no one way to do it. Before we wrap up, uh, I just want to hear, you know, what is exciting 
or energizing to you in this moment? Like, uh, is there anything about your current work and your current research that you're particularly proud of or particularly excited about right now? Yeah, well, obviously this is a uh, um, pretty special time to be writing about policing in America. Um, you know, it's a good and a bad thing. Uh, obviously more people are paying attention to issues with the police um, and problems with the police in America, which might create more political will and more public will to make changes. Um, and I think that some changes are in order. Um, but I also think that the energy has clearly already died down since uh, George Floyd was killed in the summer of 2020. Uh, I say this only as a data point, but in the summer and fall of 2020, you know, there were newspaper reporters you know, calling me multiple times a week because they were writing some story about policing and they needed a quote. And it's been months since anyone's called me now. Um, people have moved on. And that can be a little disheartening when I don't plan to move on. This is, this is you know, my area and this is what I plan to work on indefinitely. And there's still a lot of problems to solve. They, people didn't move on because we solved all the problems. They moved on because I don't know why crime rates went up or COVID is a distraction or there's a war in Ukraine or, or whatever it is that's taking people's attention away. But when you have, you know, a, a subject area that you're really passionate about, you keep focusing on it. So uh, I'm still here. I'm, I'm chipping away at these issues, at these problems, basically trying to help us understand better what are the forces that shape police behavior and why do the police behave the way they do? I think that police unions are a big part of this uh, equation. And, and I've had some research projects about um, the effects of unionization. I'm also interested in the way that the police uh, shape narratives about themselves uh, and about crime. Um, so I have a project, uh, paper's not, not out yet, but uh, hopefully soon, where we look at um, how law enforcement agencies use Facebook to communicate with the public about crime and how they may be shaping the narratives in ways that um, don't necessarily correspond with great fidelity to, to the actual facts on the ground. Because I think that, you know, the attitudes that people have about crime and about policing uh, matter a lot for, for uh, shaping the political will um, to improve the institution. So there's, you know, there's a, a lot going on. I'm also studying the private police, um, which I think become increasingly important in a world where a lot of activists are pushing to shrink the footprint uh, of the police, yet crime rates are going up. And there's already stories about uh, neighborhoods here in my hometown in Chicago putting out, you know, their own money to hire private police to fill in what they see as holes in the services provided by public policing. Well, if they're doing that, we should know a whole lot more about you know, who are the private police and and uh, what are their qualifications and how do they behave and how do they compare to the public police? So I have a project underway about that too. Well, thanks again for having me. It's a it's always a treat to get to talk about yourself. So thanks for listening. Our thanks to Professor Rappaport for his time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the others. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. See you around. <laughs>